We at the YMI are very pleased to welcome all of you to today's gathering entitled Creating Communities of Belonging for Youth with and Without Disabilities with Dr. Eric Carter. This is our third gathering for this year's YMI Lunch Lab series, and we have people from across the country and even some siblings from different places around the world gathering here today. We are so delighted to bring everyone here to this time and space. For our time today, Dr. Carter will speak to us and we will have a brief small group discussion time partway through his presentation. We'll conclude by coming back into the larger group for some more content sharing and a final Q&A time. So we ask that you please remain muted throughout the session, but we'll be monitoring our chat window. So if you have a question, please do type it in there at any time. Our office has a fantastic staff. I'd like to introduce them quickly and thank them for their work. The YMI falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Education at YDS. So we have Kelly Morrissey, the Managing Director of the Center for Continuing Ed. And we are blessed to have Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator. Thank you both for all that you do and more importantly for who you are. If you are new to the Youth Ministry Institute, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a free chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org, all one word. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth, training modules for youth leaders, discussion forums. We have over a thousand video clips and lectures given by the world's leading youth ministry experts. We have resources for anti-racism work, for youth working through mental health struggles. We have a whole array of resources on there and we are delighted to offer them to you for free. So please do check out our website. We also want you to mark your calendars for our upcoming events. We will be hosting a film screening of Indie Flix's Race to be Human on Monday, February 6th of next year in the evening. Um, Race to be Human is a documentary featuring young people of color, and it talks about how to address race with teenagers. We'll follow up the 45 minute video with a discussion panel from uh, that includes some of those involved in creating the film and one of the youth showcase they're in as well. There's accompanying educational material that we've contracted with IndieFlix to be able to offer to our participants for one year, but only to a select number of our audience. So please do keep an eye out for when that registration goes live. You won't want to miss that time. Next March, we are very pleased to be able to welcome Mark Iaconelli to our campus. We had Mark uh, present virtually for us last year about storytelling and listening with young people. And if you enjoyed that, please do consider coming to our all day event. That will be on Saturday, March 25th. Mark will explore with us the tenets of story, silence and service with young people. You won't wanna miss it. And finally, in April, we will return to our online community and welcome Deacon Ross Murray. Deacon Murray is the author of Made, Made Known Loved, which addresses how to program with an LGBTQ plus inclusive youth ministry mindset. Deacon Murray began this work in the early 2000s and continues today, so he brings a wealth of experiences and resources to the conversation. Please stay tuned for that events registration as well. I know we're looking really far ahead, but you're all busy folks and we wanna make sure we get in your calendars. But for today, we are so glad that you were able to carve time out of your calendar to be with us. Welcome. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Eric Carter. Dr. Eric C Carter is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Special Education at Vanderbilt University. He holds a particular passion for helping schools, churches, and other communities become places of membership and belonging for youth with developmental disabilities and for their families. As the co-director of the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Dr. Carter is invested in research that breaks down barriers to inclusion and equips communities to widen their welcome to this subset of the population that is frequently ostracized for whom they have been created to be. Dr. Carter has published widely in the areas of educational services and congregational ministry for children and youth with disabilities, including more than 275 articles and chapters, as well as seven books. Dr. Carter, welcome to the YMI and welcome to this space. We are so glad to have you here.
Thank you so much, Jill. Can you hear me? All right. All right. Wonderful. It's uh, a joy to be with you this afternoon and to be just among people who share a passion for promoting faith and flourishing among adolescents. I'm, I'm especially grateful to you, Jill, and to the Youth Ministry Institute for this invitation to, to join in this conversation. And it's a conversation I have titled uh, The Ache of Your Absence, uh, Creating Communities of Inclusion and Belonging for Youth with Disabilities. And I am just so uh, enamored with this simple but powerful world, word, uh, belonging. I think we're called to share this assurance that we each belong to God and to nurture communities in which we each belong to one another. And no one should ever wonder whether they really do belong. So as Jill shared, I am, uh, I'm a researcher and a professor at Vanderbilt University. And here my work has really aimed toward helping schools and businesses and churches and neighborhoods become places where people with and without disabilities can, can live and learn and work and worship and serve and support one another. Communities in our congregations where belonging and believing really abound together. And this is a passion for me that began really uh, with an unexpected encounter way back when, when I was 18 years old as a youth. And uh, perhaps like many of you, I, I grew up in the absence of people with disabilities, or, it, or I would say so it seemed. I think back to my adolescence and young people with Down syndrome or intellectual disability were never really part of the classes that I attended at school or the teams that I played on, the groups that I was part of, or even the places that I worked as a teenager. And I I suspect again that that's true for many of you, how often we lived parallel lives uh, and how often we still do. And so a trajectory focused on advancing inclusive ministry would have been the furthest thing from my adolescent mind. But my trajectory changed uh, almost entirely when I stumbled into the lives of some other young people with intellectual disability, relationships that I hadn't considered uh, or pursued, but I was quickly captivated by the friendships that we formed. And as someone who had come to think of my self and my worth being measured most in accomplishments and abilities, it was very powerful to discover that neither uh, are the things that make me lovable or valuable or worth befriending. But even more importantly, I was really compelled by the testimonies that these three new friends shared, testimonies about their deep love of God. Um, they worshiped with uh, a glad abandon. They seemed to trust uh, with, uh, without the reservations that I seem to have, they knew for sure that they belonged to Jesus. And, and I longed to have that same kind of assurance. And so what an enviable faith. And it was through their testimonies and those relationships that I became a Christian. And that shouldn't be a surprising story uh, at all. It's actually just another ordinary story of how God's grace flows through God's people to transform lives, all of God's people without exceptions, no asterisks. But it's a rare story still because we find so often that our lives so rarely intersect in our schools, they rarely intersect in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, uh, and I would say even still in our churches. So what an opportunity this introduces for the church. Well, fast forward to now. Uh, as Jill shared, I'm a social scientist and a professor. I'm not a youth minister, but what I do do is study the place of faith in the lives of youth and young adults with developmental disabilities. And we also study the postures and the practices of churches and ministries and communities that either embrace them well or exclude them. Uh, and this is also the work I know that many of you are, are deeply invested in, or at least I hope you will be. And so what I'd like to do is share a small snapshot of what we've been learning through our research about what it, what it might mean to become a ministry marked by belonging, a, a community marked by belonging, whether it's young people with developmental disabilities or perhaps anyone who finds themselves on that outside looking in. And I think our churches are called to be the kinds of communities that, that embrace far more readily than they exclude. And it turns out, uh, actually, by my calculations, there are a whole lot of churches, a whole lot of churches. Uh, the numbers I see vary, particularly after the pandemic, but uh, there are more than 325,000 congregations across the United States. In every community, small and large, you are parts of congregations in your own community as well. 
Turns out we have a lot of them in Nashville. I think most of the congregations are actually in Nashville proper, at least from this map, where every red dot is another church, one on every corner, uh, seriously, in many ways. But for those of you coming from Connecticut, there's 2,600 in your state and many, obviously, in every corner of our community and around the world. So I think the communities that our congregations are striving to reach and then to love and to serve and to receive are also filled with people with disabilities. And here, too, the, the numbers uh, we see vary, but estimates uh, often suggest that about one in five Americans uh, identifies as having some type of disability. And of course, it's disabilities defined and experienced in so many varied ways. That's a point we'll return to a bit later, but uh, people with disabilities have a presence in the communities that our congregations and our youth ministries are trying to reach. Uh, for some of us, statistics feel a little abstract. Uh, so I thought I'd just make this a little bit more concrete and pull up a neighborhood. Uh, it could be a neighborhood that surrounds your own uh, church as well. But if we were to leave this webinar and travel out into those neighborhoods and begin to knock on doors, what we would find is that every third house whose door we knocked on would include at least one member of that family who's impacted by disability. Uh, it could be these homes. Uh, obviously, this is just for illustration. So when we hear that biblical question of who, who is my neighbor, uh, our answers might begin to broaden as we think about that as well. So what are then the postures of these 325,000 churches uh, when it comes to disability? And what are the postures of the communities in which our churches are located? And so I thought to illustrate this and provide context for our conversation specifically around thinking about youth ministry, that it might be helpful to share a short bit of history uh, around the ways our country and society has uh, uh, a thought about disability and community in reference to people with disabilities. So hope you will uh, bear with a little bit of blunt history as we go through this, because I think looking backwards helps us kind of see where our own ministries might be in the stream of this history and where we might go next. And I'll use my own lifespan of a, just about 50 years here as kind of a point of reference. So at the time I was born in the early 1970s, uh, young people with intellectual disability were still excluded from so many aspects of community life. Uh, you might uh, not know, but they were excluded from local public schools, uh, from so many workplaces, from neighborhoods, and so many other activities. And as we thought about our communities, that meant there were holes. Communities were incomplete because people weren't present. Well, things began to change uh, pretty dramatically in the 70s and then in the 80s as new spaces and new programs began to be created for children and adults with intellectual disability to, to learn and to work and to live and recreate and worship. But actually, so often the opportunities that were born in a response to exclusion were almost always provided in separate settings apart from any other person who didn't have that same disability label. And that was the de facto choice. It was made without ever meeting you. And sometimes those options of separateness were the only choice. And so still in most communities, everyday life was lived away from people with intellectual disability. Well, in the 80s and then the 90s, uh, the time I was going through elementary and then middle school and even into high school, the shift was really towards in ensuring that, that people with disabilities were integrated within ordinary aspects of community life. So our schools, our businesses, our residential programs, our recreational programs all began to grow ex uh, ex exponentially, really. But what we saw so often is that the opportunities that emerged in these different locations, including in our churches, still involved a certain separation self-contained or separate classrooms in schools or work enclaves or large group homes that were in a community but tucked in parts of the community that people rarely went. And so what often we saw is that people with developmental disabilities were near, but not really among their peers without disabilities. And there's a big difference between being near one another and being among one another. 
And that takes us to the present day, where the last really two decades, as we've thought about uh, our postures and uh, of community in relation to developmental disability, has shifted towards inclusion. The full inclusion of people in the same classrooms and clubs and colleges and church activities and, and community groups as anyone else. Inclusion, it's from, uh, I think, uh, another way of thinking about this movement of prepositions from being apart from one another to being among one another to now being with one another. And those prepositions really do matter. Well, there's one actual additional destination I think that I would add to this list that maybe you've seen in some ways in, in various variations, at least in my view. When I talk with youth and young adults with developmental disabilities who are part of our uh, college campus here at Vanderbilt, part of the programs and schools, they talk about wanting to be more than just merely integrated or even included. They talk about wanting to belong. We long to belong. And there's something past mere inclusion uh, that I think is a destination we're still working towards. It's about being part of a community where we are seen as indispensable, where we start to see one another in fundamentally different ways, not as the ins and the outs, uh, the members and the strangers, the ones who are labeled and those who are the labelers or who are not, but we're one community, one faith community, one, one community diverse, absolutely, but every person of equal and immeasurable value, where every person is known and accepted and needed. But it's not just a community that sees one another different, that marks belonging. It also means we do more than just share space. We also share our lives. We become knitted together and woven into relationships. And we stay involved in each other's lives after class ends, uh, beyond the benediction, after we dismiss from our youth group, after we clock out of work, we stay engaged in each other's lives all seven days of the week, where every person is now befriended and supported and loved. So do you see, as we look at this progression, some of the differences in these portraits over time historically? And do you see the difference between mere inclusion and belonging? Uh, the difference between being present in a place or in a group and having a presence in that place or group? Or for our congregations, it's the difference between welcoming youth with disabilities who arrive and welcoming their presence versus actually aching because of their absence and pursuing people who aren't yet there. So I share these five portraits actually not as a history lesson. I wasn't totally truthful. It does reflect where we've been and how we've moved along the way, but it actually turns out these portraits aren't past history. They're actually living history. What you see on the screen is really a the current landscape of disability and ministry within the contemporary church. In fact, these are the prevailing models of ministry we see across those 300 plus thousand churches in the United States, many more around the world, where we see examples abound of congregations that are marked by exclusion or separation or integration of those with developmental disabilities and other disabilities as well. And a much smaller, but fortunately growing number of churches that are being described as places of true inclusion and deep belonging. So I hope that helps you begin to kind of picture some of the ways that we think about communities or live out communities when it uh, comes to young people with developmental disabilities. And what I've just done here is now folded in some additional language or ways of talking about these portraits that might connect a bit more to how we think about life as a church. These are drawn from uh, Bill Gaventa, who's been a real leader in this area of disability and ministry, who talks about this movement of prepositions, that we're going from ministry apart from people with disabilities to ministry to, to ministry among, to ministry with, and to ministry with and by young people with disabilities. So I hope this is prompting your own reflection. And in fact, we're going to go into some brief breakout rooms to for you to be able to share some of your reactions to this series of portraits. As you think about the congregations that you lead or the ministries that you lead and are part of, as you think about disability, I wonder which of these portrait 
portraits or, or multiple portraits kind of depict what you see in your midst. Um, and so kind of where are you right now in your own congregation or in your ministry? And we will come back and talk about where we go next and how we move forward into that space of inclusion and belonging. All right. Well, welcome back. I hope that was a fruitful time just to reflect and begin to situate yourself in, in terms of sort of this broader history, but also to anchor it to where are we right now as a congregation and where do we want to go next? What kind of community do we want to be marked by as we move forward in this space? So let's uh, begin to park now more on this last destination of inclusion uh, and belonging. I think this is the destination that we're reaching for, that we're striving for, that we know matters so much to ourselves and to the youth that we serve. But um, but it's a hard thing to define. And I think all of you on the webinar, um, uh, all of you on the webinar know firsthand this great pleasure of belonging to someone uh, or somewhere. And I suspect you've all had times where you felt the hurt that comes when we know we don't. So the question is, how might our churches and our youth ministries and the communities that we're part of become places of belonging for young people who still wonder whether there really is a place for them? But answering these questions require us to move really from the conceptual uh, to the actual concrete. And uh, that raises the question of what does it even mean to belong? Uh, and I've noticed just in my own work as a researcher, the things that matter most are always the hardest to define in our work. And uh, so I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on this question. And this time we're just going to use the chat. And I'd like you to, uh, in the chat, find your chat uh, and fill in this sentence. Um, I know I belong when blank. And so think about a place, maybe it's your church, your neighborhood, elsewhere, where you feel certain that you belong, and what tells you that's the case. And I'll read some of these out as they're popping in and encourage you to as well. I'm missed. I'm accepted exactly how I am. People pay attention to me. People greet me by name. I'm known by name. My gifts are valued, uh, which means they're also known. Uh, I'm among good listeners, a place I feel uh, uh, comfortable where I'm listened to where people know my name. Uh, I'm able to be authentic. I can leave when I need. People genuinely ask what's happening in my life. When you pass them and they say, how are you? They actually want to know the answer to that question. Wonderful. I'm invited to be part of things. My story is valued. I can get to the bathroom, right? If you can't go, you won't go. Uh, they say, in terms of accessibility. So you can keep popping those in, and uh, we'll reference those as well. But understanding our own experience of that will also help us understand the experiences of, of youth uh, with developmental disabilities. So there's so many different answers, as you see in the chat, to these questions. And I'm not here to answer or offer the definitive word. Uh, the, there are, are other perspectives on belonging to consider. Uh, there's a wonderful talk by Dr. Margaret Clark on belonging recorded just a couple years ago and posted on the uh, uh, YMI, uh, YMI website as well. But I'd like to share what we have learned when we pose this question to hundreds of young people with developmental disabilities and their families who've been part of our various studies here at Vanderbilt. Uh, what is it that assures you that you belong in your faith community? And they shared with us that belonging was experienced when they were present and invited, when they were welcomed and known, accepted and supported, cared for, befriended, needed, and loved. And I'll spend the rest of my time briefly sharing what each of these 10 dimensions means and why it matters, because I think there are some of the areas here in which your ministries may already be making great strides and can celebrate. And you may also see there's areas in which there's more work still to do. But very quickly, you'll see the story of what it means to belong from young people with disabilities resemble so closely what it means to belong that you've placed in the chat as well. 
So let's get started walking through each of these 10 dimensions of belonging. And we'll begin with presence because belonging always begins with presence. It's built on this foundation of shared experiences and repeated encounters over time. And yet in so many youth ministries, this principal barrier to belonging may simply be the absence of youth impacted by disability. It's just hard to feel like you're part of a community from the outside, isn't it? And you start to see that so many of the other dimensions that follow to be known, to be accepted, to be cared for, to be befriended, to be needed, to be loved. They are hard and sometimes impossible to experience only from a distance. And so I've heard it said we would gladly welcome young people with disabilities uh, if they were part of a youth group, but there isn't anyone here. And it raises this question of why is that the case? Because the cities and the neighborhoods in which we each live that surround our churches include many youth with disabilities. Nearly one in seven middle and high school students, about 15% of any local public school that uh, live in your community has a disability that somehow impacts their learning or their relationships or their health. This is what you would discover if you glanced into the local schools or you talk with special educators in your area. 15% of all youth uh, fit that description. And in fact, there are nearly 3 million youth with disabilities ages 13 to 18 who receive special education services in their schools in the US. In Connecticut, that's about 35,000 teens. And of course, for uh, some of these young people with disabilities, the impact will be very substantial. It will be readily apparent. But for others, those needs are going to be much less visible or only evident in certain areas or certain times. So the pie chart that I put on the screen breaks down that uh, those types of disabilities that are found when we look at our local public schools and look at special education data in that sense. The largest group being students with learning disabilities or speech language impairments or other health impairments, as well as autism or intellectual disability or emotional behavioral challenges or other disabilities like visual or hearing impairments. But it raises a powerful point of reflection. What would a peek into our youth ministry gatherings and events, our camps, our retreats, our, our churches say about the presence of youth with disabilities? Might there be young people right in our midst who still remain on the peripheries of all that we do? And what would it take then to change this particular situation? Well, I want to emphasize that the absence of youth with disabilities, if that is the case in your church, is not due to the unimportance of their faith. For example, in one of our studies, we asked, in this case, parents of 440 youth who had intellectual disability or autism about the extent to which they agreed with these five statements regarding their youth. Uh, my child prays daily. 56% of parents said that's true of my son or daughter. They look to their faith as providing meaning and purpose in their life. That was true for 57% of their children. They consider themselves to be active in their faith community or congregation. 61% said that. They enjoy being around others who share their faith. 72% said that. And their faith impacts many of their decisions. That was 49%. If you looked across all five of those items, which just come from a standard scale around um, uh, uh, the importance of faith, more than 80% agreed or strongly agreed with at least one of these statements. And so, like anyone else, young people with disabilities want to know and be known by God. They want to love and be loved by their neighbors, to serve and be served by others, to discover and live out their calling. And like anyone else, they want to explore and share and deepen their faith in the midst of a caring and committed community, like anyone else. And you see that in the quotes reflected here on the screen. Uh, just to emphasize, for those of you who are taking photos of screens, we're going to send out the handouts as well, which will have all of this in there. So no worries about that as well. But there also seems to be a gap then between the priorities of youth and the actual participation of youth. And I won't share too much data as we go, but that's my accent of how I help tell the story. We don't have great data nationally, but on this figure, what I've done is arrayed uh, the reported participation of youth with disabilities in our study in worship services, 
which was 64% attending weekly or a quarter monthly and yearly to yearly. Uh, in religious education classes, which is about 46% weekly and 16% monthly to yearly, to social events, and then to youth groups, which is about 24% of youth with disabilities weekly, 12% monthly or yearly. So you start to see youth connected to congregations, but when it comes to smaller places where youth might gather in groups or youth retreats or mission trips or social events, the numbers start to drop dramatically. Now, I don't have comparative data on youth without disabilities, which would be really helpful to see how these two line up in that sense as well. But we know in every study, the data are less participation, less presence. And there are many reasons for why people might be less present. It's not because of the importance of their faith, but historically it was because of the design of our buildings. There were architectural barriers that kept us from gathering together. I collect pictures of inaccessible churches. Uh, it's an odd collection, but people have started sending these to me. I used to think this was the most inaccessible church in the world, at least physically, built into the side of the mountain. And then folks after that conference started emailing me pictures of other churches uh, that seem to be designed very specifically without some segments of their community in mind like this church in Italy that's taken it to literally new heights of inaccessibility. But I do believe this is the most inaccessible uh, church in all of the world. It's in Eastern Europe. It's actually a monastery, but you, you get the point here. Um, these pictures kind of get a chuckle in some way because they're caricatures. They're caricatures, but subtler barriers send the same message. What do our buildings and where we gather, communicate about our theology, about who we expect to be there. What do the steps say? A classroom or a gathering space that's physically inaccessible. A curriculum for some youth that's intellectually inaccessible. A summer camp or retreat centers that we go as a group that lack accommodations. Does where we gather and how we gather suggest that inadvertently even, we might be thinking about our community too narrowly. So it might be other barriers. In fact, it's less often accessibility barriers for the majority of youth who don't have mobility issues, but it's often barriers of awareness or attitude or invitation or expectations. Sometimes it's barriers of theology or values or just the barriers of the boundaries of our imagination. So presence is the baseline for belonging. It's a starting point for us, but it's not our destination. It reflects and enables ministry among youth with disabilities, but we're called to press deeper into this space. Well, second, we heard that uh, uh, to belong is to be invited. An increasing presence often requires extending new invitations. That was the second dimension of belonging, that we've heard from youth and their families. It's, it's to be invited, to, to be sought out, to be pursued. And rather as a ministry than waiting or hoping for youth with disabilities to arrive, the posture of a community committed to belonging shifts towards pursuing youth who are not yet there. And what a difference it would make if we did more inviting in this space. And we're called to invite, right? The great banquet's not set for a select few, God's design for the body is so much grander than our own, and we are to invite those who never get invited out, to uh, invite people in places where no one else is inviting with this irresistible offer that fills the very house of God. And yet, those kinds of invitations remain rare for some segments of our community. I want you to see some data that's pretty striking from a, an early iteration of a national study called the National Longitudinal Transition Study here in the United States. What they found in their study is that half of all youth with autism had not been invited to any other social activity by another youth in the last year. That was true for one in four youth with intellectual disability, one in four. And of course, this is broader data on social participation. We don't have the data on whether there's invitations to youth programming and youth events that we offer as well. So an invitation is this very simple gesture, but it's so powerful to know that others want to be in our midst, that our company is desired or even needed. It sends a powerful message that says, we want you here. We need your presence 
It just wouldn't be the same without you. And I think it speaks volumes when our churches are at the forefront of inviting uh, youth with disabilities in their community and their city, because that's so few places in our community that are doing that kind of pursuing of people. But it also speaks volumes when our churches aren't at the forefront of that. And I'm afraid I, I don't see enough evidence that we're really on the leading edge of this. Uh, and I think that's a place that we ought to be. When we're not intentional about reaching out throughout our communities, we inadvertently leave people out. In fact, reflecting on the kind of absence of people with disabilities from his church, one pastor said, uh, quote, it's not that we deliberately excluded people with disabilities. In fact, we weren't deliberate at all. And that was the problem. And I think that's the quote that probably characterizes what we still tend to see today within and beyond the church. There are people who are not always a forethought. We uh, we will welcome people when they come. We'll think about how to accommodate. We'll make sure that, they're, uh, that, that uh, there's a, a delight at their arrival. But how do we think about uh, making sure that this is not an afterthought, but a forethought? And so we have to be del doubly deliberate, I think, in this area. You know, it turns out I also collect church signs. Um, and uh, I think we do a pretty good job of broadcasting our commitment to reaching all youth or all people or to receiving all youth. Uh, these, I know I need another hobby, but these are signs that make that clear. All are welcome. You're welcome here, everyone, uh, and on and on to welcome all. Uh, it's become quite common to proclaim that we're welcoming in all these places on our websites and our promotional materials. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm just saying we often presume it's sufficient to announce our posture, that everyone is welcome, every person. But it's easy to say that. It's harder to mean that. And there's a big difference between an announcement and an invitation, right? An invitation is personal. An announcement's not. An invitation says, we are thinking about you. We want you here to be part of all that happens. An announcement leaves open the possibility that there's this tiny little asterisk or uh, a footnote or an exception or some kind of unspoken qualifier, kind of like the question mark on this graphic. And so when we pronounce that every youth is welcome or everyone is welcome, for people who have experienced inclusion in the past, they will wonder whether they we really mean them. And so our invitations should absolutely abound. Uh, they should endure. And when they do, belonging is in a much better position to follow. With that takes us to the third dimension of belonging. Uh, you know, as God's people, we should uh, indeed have a reputation, but it should be a reputation of the good kind, a reputation for welcoming well, because the way that people are greeted and treated by others, it says a lot about their place within the community. And to be welcomed is to be received by others with warmth, with an authentic delight. In other words, people find pleasure in our presence. And it's often through everyday gestures that people come to feel welcomed. It means greeting youth with disabilities like you would anyone else, greeting them when they arrive, and knowing their names, and asking about their week, and introducing them to others, and drawing them into conversations, inviting them to events, remembering their birthday, involving them in a small group, and, and noticing when they're not there and following up to find out why. These are ordinary gestures that send a powerful message that one parent of a teenager with Down syndrome described simply by saying, we felt like we were wanted. And no one should wonder whether they're wanted. That should be an automatic presumption. But it matters so much because if you've ever heard the church stories of families impacted by disability, you find they are almost never lukewarm. There are families who leave church each week feeling welcomed well, and others who leave church feeling uh, deeply wounded until they stop coming altogether. In fact, in one of our studies, we found that one in three families had left their congregation because their son or daughter with a developmental disability wasn't welcomed or included. One in three families. And how many have left our groups or gatherings for the same reason? How do we widen that welcome? Now, I know for some of us, uh, certainly for the 18-year-old version of me as well, this is new territory, right? We wonder how to welcome someone when disability enters the equation. 
what, what do I do? What, what do I say? What if I do or say the wrong thing? And that kind of uncertainty can sometimes make people feel reluctant to interact with youth at all, particularly those with more extensive support needs. Uh, you know, that uncertainty almost always leads to avoidance. And maybe you've noticed that as well. And so here's where it can be helpful to provide information and guidance. We want to model what it looks like to use respectful and relevant language, to strike up a conversation with someone who has complex communication challenges, to support someone whose behavior is just a little bit different or seems unusual, to pray with someone without words. So if you aren't sure where to begin, you don't have to figure this out on your own. There are leaders within disability organizations all throughout your local community who can help you along the way. There's ARC chapters and Down Syndrome Associations and Autism Societies and Independent Living Centers and all who know the disability side well and can help you uh, uh, chart a course that makes the experience of coming into your community one that's experienced as, as, as welcoming. You see, it's not the host who determines what's welcoming, it's the guest. And sometimes we need help seeing our ministries from the vantage point of the stranger, the not yet arrived, to see whether it's really welcoming for others as well. Well, the fourth aspect of belonging involves being known. And I saw this in the chat, right? People love to hear their names. Uh, this might be silly to bring up at a, a youth ministry talk, but I'm reminded of that old theme song from the sitcom Cheers. So that dates some of us automatically. Right? You remember, I won't sing it, but the lyrics were sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, right? Where they're always glad you came. So that's whether that name is shouted across a room, it's uttered on the other end of a phone, it's called out in a group. We long to hear our names. But the joy of being known here from what we've heard from individuals and families, it's more than just being noticed and recognized by name. And that's certainly important, but it comes from being understood deeply and personally. See, to be known is to be seen as a person uniquely created by God and appreciated by others for, for all of who you are. And having that relationship with people who see you and affirm you is so central to belonging. And as Christians, we're called to welcome the, the stranger. That's part of this practice of hospitality but it's also the case that people should not remain strangers for very long. And yet we find that many youth with disabilities, many adults still find themselves in this role of kind of that perpetual stranger. They're known about, but not known personally. And there's a big difference between those. But it's interesting that what we've heard from individuals, youth and their families is not so much about whether they're known, but more about how they're known in a community. And I put some professional definitions uh, uh, and diagnostic criteria around disability up on the screen. I don't want you to remember this <laughs> at all. Um, this is how the world defines disability in many ways. And what do you notice? It's the accent on what someone cannot do or struggles to do. It's an accent on deficits and challenges that someone is said to experience. This is what the world so often sees. It's often all they see. And yet what an incomplete way to come to know someone within the body, only by their limitations or challenges. It flattens a portrait of a person. It's the danger of a single story and how prone we are to label and mislabel people, including within the church. What is it that we think we know about disability? And there is of course another way, a different way to know youth with disabilities by the strengths and the gifts and the passions and the positive qualities that they bring to their relationships and to their communities. As Beth noted in chat, to move beyond deficits, not to know people by the things that imply they're incapable, but the things that remind us that they are absolutely indispensable. That's where we should shine. Can we see youth with disabilities as having strengths and contributions and gifts and friendship to be received? That should be part of our DNA. And if so, can your youth group, can your church find a place for every gift? Because when we're committed to belonging, we do that one person at a time. And we seek to learn each youth's unique story. We strive to understand their interests and skills and talents and calling that they bring to community. And then we find a place where those are things are exactly what is needed. We strive to see them as God sees them, as beautiful, as a new creation, 
as very good, it's called by name, it's fearfully and wonderfully made, the way we would want to know, come to know any youth. And when we know each person well, and with this very countercultural lens, well, now we're in a much better position to support and befriend and need and love each person well also. It's one thing to be included. Uh, it's quite another, though, to be accepted. And real acceptance comes not from being known about, but actually from being known personally. When we interview parents about the markers of inclusion for their teenagers with disabilities, they talk about their daughters and sons being welcomed without condition. These are the quotes we hear, treated like family, embraced for all of who they are. And those are the things we want to hear from parents over and over and over. But it's not what we hear over and over and over from families that are part of our projects and collaborations. You know, as societal attitudes toward disability have changed dramatically over the last 50 years of that history that I shared with you, we are still a long way away from this assurance of acceptance. It's true in our youth ministries, in our churches. It's true in the society and the communities that surround our churches. The same sort of prejudices and stereotypes and stigma that we see elsewhere are also found in our faith communities. And it's evidenced in the stories families share. It's reflected in the quotes on the screen. We're just not equipped to serve your son. We don't really do inclusion here. Maybe you feel more comfortable at another church that has a special program for her. We're not really sure he'll get much out of being part of our group. The behaviors are a bit of distraction, and I won't unpack this here. I'm not sure he really can grasp the gospel. No one should wonder whether there's a place for them. And what are the attitudes that underlie these kinds of quotes that families still hear too often? Our attitude should be strikingly different. In our relationships with one another, we're told to have the mindset of Christ Jesus. We actually know a lot about the pathways for changing attitudes. We know that there's a place for sharing accurate information and even providing some education related to disability. And maybe that has a place in your youth ministry. We know that it's good to host activities that raise awareness and increase understanding. We know there's great power in what we each model to others and in the stories that we tell. But the investment that we make in fostering friendships and promoting shared inclusive activities, that will actually have the most substantial impact on the views that people hold. It turns out from research that more than anything else, personal encounters are the key to promoting acceptance. It's through relationships that our preconceived ideas about the stranger or the other get overturned, not through learning about people, but through coming to know people. Well, six, some youth with disabilities are going to need support to be fully part of all the activities and the events that comprise your youth ministry. For example, that might include transportation to events or accessible materials, uh, assistance from a peer or adapted equipment, maybe creative use of technology or something else altogether. It's that right combination of ordinary supports and individualized supports that makes meaningful participation possible. But when we get those supports down, when we're committed to that, it says we are actually clearly committed to and we desire a person's presence. If we support people, that's a tangible way to say, we want you here. Well, uh, this is not a place at all for recipe work. I can't tell you what supports you should put in place in your youth group. I can share ideas. This is a place for asking good questions. It's less about assumptions we make. Questions like, what could we do to make Sunday morning or Wednesday night the best time of the week for you or for your daughter or son? How can we come alongside you all seven days of the week, not just on Sundays, but between Sundays? Uh, how can we make sure that you are part of everything we do here? And youth can often share that information for themselves. And for other times, we'll have to hear that from families who provide those kinds of critical insights. Again, it's not recipe work. The best uh, supports are always individualized. They're always determined one person at a time. And so when we meet with youth and their families, maybe along with friends or other supporters they identify, we think about our plan for supporting meaningful participation. We find out what areas of involvement are important to them. 
We ask about their goals in areas like faith formation and social relationships and service to others and participation. And then we start to say, what's the kind of informal and formal supports that could help them in these areas? And if we need to, we're equipping others in our church to provide those supports in respectful and effective ways. Communities that are committed to belonging see that kind of support as essential, not as optional. And they go even further. They put supports in place as a forethought rather than as a reactive afterthought as well. And again, remember, it seems overwhelming if this is a new space, but there are groups in your community. There are people in your church who know a lot about how to do this well that can be invited into these conversations. Well, seventh, healthy communities are invested in the flourishing of their members, right? They're marked by a deep care for one another. And we strive to support the spiritual and the emotional and the practical needs of youth who are in our midst. It's receiving that kind of care that tells you that you matter, that you, that you belong. And the opportunity here for us is to think about how we might care for youth all seven days of the week, not just when we gather at church, uh, not for three hours on a Sunday morning or a couple hours on a Wednesday night. How can we promote their flourishing every day of the week? And this is a different way, probably not about thinking of youth ministry, but so often when churches think about disability ministry, they're thinking about Sunday morning and missing the opportunities for care and for exchange of care and support throughout the year. Uh, throughout the week. It, it begins by getting to know people and learning out what they would consider to be most helpful. Helpful. We want to avoid assumptions here that don't reflect their preferences or priorities. You know, we can extend care in healing ways and in wounding ways. And so we don't want to thrust that on people. But there are creative ways that we're seeing congregations address areas like youth employment. Uh, and I can talk about that in the Q&A of some creative ways churches are putting faith to work for young people transitioning out of school and out of their home or addressing housing needs or transportation needs, which are huge for many people with developmental disabilities. Things like helping someone find a, a job that reflects their calling, connecting them to a safe and affordable place to live, helping them get around town, but it's also not overlooking very simple ways in which we can demonstrate care, uh, providing a ride, stopping by to check in, sharing a meal, helping someone find that job, praying with them, going to a medical appointment, helping with a bill, sending a card, um, calling to say hello, helping with housework, just being present together. And everything I just named, you do not have to have expertise or experience related to disability to do. That's part and parcel of what we do for any young person or in our congregations. But we wonder what does that look like when disability is part of the equation. So it's as much ordinary gestures as it is thinking about specialized ones as well. Well, eighth is uh, belonging is rooted in relationships. It's to be befriended. It's having people in our lives who, uh, who know us and like us and accept us and need us, who miss us, as people said in the chat, and who love us. Those are the things that are at the heart of our well-being. And of course, the same is exactly true for youth with developmental disabilities. Their desire for friendships and other supportive relationships is not different. It's not diminished. It's grounded in the core belief that we are created for community. We're created for relationship with God and within one another. And as we learn very early in scriptures, it's not good to be alone. And I think all the other seven dimensions of belonging that I've talked about so far, in some ways you can almost address them in the absence of a close ongoing relationship. You can do some of them at arm's length. Like you can be welcoming, you can be accepting, you can arrange supports, you can direct care, but friendships take belonging deeper. Having a friend means there's someone in your life who says, I choose you too. And it's just not good to be alone. And yet, alone is what we often see. I want you to think about the relationships that you have in your own life. Uh, think about every person you know, family members, right? Uh, friends and close companions. Uh, people you see occasionally or might be a kind of an acquaintance. And then there are people who are paid to be part of your life. And I'm putting that bluntly, of course, right? Your doctor, your auto mechanic your boss. Uh, I would anticipate that names would abound for you. 
and that they would abound in every circle. And in fact, the social scientists uh, tell us that the average person knows 150 to 600 people. So we actually know a lot of people. Uh, now, I don't have that many relationships because I'm a social scientist and people tend not to like to hang out with social scientists, it turns out. So, so mine's a little more constrained, but yours is robust, I'm sure. The thing is that when we reflect on the same set of circles for adolescents with intellectual disability or autism, it's not that we see a different number of names showing up. It's that we see names showing up in different places, certainly in family and in a whole host of professionals who are instrumental and important. I'm not diminishing, but whose job it is to be part of a person's lives, OTs and PTs and SLPs and special educators and paraprofessionals and healthcare providers. And those circles of friends and acquaintances tend to be smaller and narrower. What's our role in blowing up those circles for young people by giving them the opportunities to meet others, to, uh, to engage with them, to get to know them and develop out of that opportunities to be picked as a friend? I shared with you a national study earlier of youth with disabilities the data bear out what I'm sharing. If you'll notice, uh, these are just teens with various different types of disabilities and the percentage who never or rarely receive phone call from friends or who never get together with friends in the last 12 months. And I suspect that we would see a certain uh, percentage of young people without disabilities who would also miss out on these important relationships. We know that loneliness is epidemic and isolation abounds all the more in the midst of of the pandemic. And so it's a challenge for us to be intentional about those relationships that are forming within our churches among youth and beyond, or they don't happen automatically for people. As we think about youth with or without disabilities in our, in our ministries, can we name people who he can eat with or walk with or celebrate with and cry with or play with, or pray with, or shop with, or watch a movie with, or just hang out and do nothing with. And I know I ended all of those uh, with a preposition, so I apologize for that if you're an English major, but it just sounds better that way. My point is that relationships have to be a central marker of any experience that we label as being inclusive or inclusion. We can't call it an inclusive ministry if no one knows his name. We can't call it really a faith community if there's no community for him in that place. So how do we introduce relationships into this piece of the puzzle? It's not really rock and science. There's not a actual friendship formula, but there kind of is. If you think about how you make friends and, and the relationships you have, it turns out friendships are most likely to form when people participate in shared activities around common interests over a sustained period of time. Shared activities plus common interests over time. And so that we're also making sure that every person receives the invitations and supports to participate in all the activities that you offer. And so we have to deepen our commitment to inclusive activities because that exponentially expands the opportunities that youth with and without disabilities have to meet one another, to discover friendships, we find out what a, a kid's interests and hobbies and passions are, and we figure out who else, what other youth have those same interests and hobbies and passions, and we try to connect them. For those with developmental disabilities, we have to make sure that there's enough support in those activities and that people, young people have valued roles in those activities, that they are not the designated service project or the recipient of support. They're also the ones who are ministering to uh, as well. So God's people, I think, should shine when it comes to fostering relationships. Just as we've been befriended, uh, we should also likewise befriend others. And so this is why I just want to punctuate the importance of what takes place between our youth group meetings, between Sundays. It's life lived together beyond the walls of our buildings that actually pushes people from acquaintances towards close friendships. And it's the ordinary gestures I talked about earlier, right? Getting together for a good meal around the same table, uh, participating in the same favorite hobby, getting together to watch the favorite team and root for them, listening to the favorite, the shared favorite songs on Spotify, catching a movie, taking a stroll through the park, watching the ball drop, being part of the same small group. Those are the kinds of things that set the occasion for friendships to occur.
We can't make them happen, but we are so good at preventing them from ever having the opportunity to happen. And so I think this point has implications for how we think about ministry related to youth with disabilities. If our main models are largely separate or segregated, as we're seeing in many churches in the current national study of disability ministry that we're doing right now, then the opportunity for young people with disabilities to be picked as a friend becomes limited. But just as importantly, the opportunity for others to encounter the faith and the gifts of people impacted by disability also becomes more limited. I grew up in a world that was marked most by exclusion and segregation, and maybe that was true for you. And yet I thank God for the way, uh, just the way God orchestrated a way for me to stumble into the lives of three other adolescents uh, whose friendship was actually transformative for me as well. And that leads to the ninth dimension of belonging. It's to be needed. The richest forms of community are marked by a, a real reciprocity among members, right? Every person is seen as having gifts and talents and stories and strengths that can benefit others, that benefit the entire community. Uh, we know that every person in our midst is endowed with immeasurable worth. But we also know that not every person in our midst always feels valued. And so much of contemporary society struggles to see the ways in which young people with developmental disabilities can enrich the lives of others and make important contributions within their community. We still see people as the designated focus of ministry rather than the ones who are also doing ministry and participating in all we do. So when our church or our community sees people with disabilities as indispensable and even crucial to its flourishing, that shines a powerful counterpoint to all of the prevailing cultural views out there. And there's something about being part of a community that, uh, that seeks out and affirms your gifts, that assures you that, re that you really do belong there. We all want to know that our presence matters, that, our, uh, that we're needed by others, and that our absence evokes in some way a longing for our return. And you see that in the quotes I put up on your screen. When people are saying, where's Aria, Aria today? You know, we're doing so-and-so. We need Aria. You know, we want her here. Uh, as someone said in the chat, you know you belong when you're missed. And so I'm convinced a healthy church can find a place for every gift that we identify and develop the gifts and talents of youth with developmental disabilities in our midst, just as we would do for anyone. And then we look for places where those gifts and talents are precisely what other people need. That Sam's beautiful voice should have a place in the youth choir. That Javier's contagious smile would serve the congregation well as a greeter. That Evan's obsession with detail of it having to be a particular way every time could actually be pretty instrumental on the setup team. That Aiden's servant spirit would really help in the homeless ministry and Neva's faithfulness would enrich our church's prayer team. The presence of a disability does not at all diminish one's gifting. Every person is called to serve one another with the gifts that they've been given. And that's why I love this church sign so much. Uh, it's one next door to where my kids went to high school. And I don't know what the pastor or whoever does this had in mind when they put this up. I actually don't have any idea. But to me, it suggests the posture that I wish every church and every youth ministry would adopt as we think about their, uh, the community as, as one that thoroughly includes young people with disabilities, that we need you here ASAP. We're incomplete without your presence, without your friendship, without your gifts. And you all know that verse uh, probably really well. I put the paraphrase up on the screen because I think it articulates it well. That the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church, every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention, the parts we don't, the parts we see, the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. And if one part flourishes, every other part enters into exuberance. We all need one another, every part, none less than the others. Well, that takes us to the 10th dimension of belonging, which I know those of you watching the clock thought I would never get to. And I bet you don't need someone from Vanderbilt telling you what love has to do with belonging, right? We know the great lengths we go 
to those whom we love, for those who we love. We know we make allowances. We go the extra mile. We know the way we extend grace and sacrifice our own interests, where we avoid what's expedient. We work for the good of others. Love is a thing that leads us to care about people's flourishing all seven days of the week, after school dismisses, outside of the workday, after the final hymn is sung. And when people talk about the communities that matter most to them, they usually talk about the love that they encounter there. And so where love abounds, I think belonging is much more likely to be experienced, right? We are made to love and to be loved. The scriptures remind us over and over that all we do, all we are, must be marked by this. And I, I know it sounds a little bit like I'm preaching, and I'm not a preacher, but maybe the greatest of all these dimensions of belonging is also to be loved. One of the pioneers in my field, uh, Wolf Wolfensberger, who really uh, was an a huge influence on the deinstitutionalization movement, talked about uh, healing for wounded people with disabilities, beginning with these three messages, maybe for anyone, right? You are valuable, you are as valuable as any other person, and you are loved by those around us. And that's a message we should proclaim, not merely with our words or our church signs, but through our relationships. Love is to be felt, not only to be heard. Well, that's a simple portrait of belonging, if it's simple, from the vantage point of youth with disabilities and families who shared their stories and their struggles as part of our research project. Stories of hospitality and hurt, uh, a portrait that I think ought to push us towards reflection and tip us towards some sort of response. So as we think about the groups in which we gather, the communities that we're part of, the ministries that we lead, are young people with disabilities personally and purposefully invited? Are they present in all aspects of what we do? Are they experiencing an extravagant welcome whenever they arrive? Are they well known and known well, known well and rightly throughout our community? Are they accepted without condition or caveat? Are they provided the support they need to participate fully and meaningfully and receiving care in ways that lead to their flourishing in all kinds of ways? Are they developing deep and enduring friendships with others and seen as needed and indispensable to the thriving of the community? And most of all, are they loved deeply and unconditionally? And it's a place of reflection. Uh, these are actually actions in many ways for us as congregations. What are we doing to invite, to welcome, to make sure people are known, to accept, to care for, to befriend. We phrase these in ways that takes an abstract concept like belonging and puts them into key places of reflection and action. And I hope this framework resonates with you because it turns out, I think this is what we want for every youth in our midst. It's what we want for every member of our church. This is not really actually a conversation about those impacted by disability, although that's the lens through which I've told the story through our research and projects. This is actually a window into what we all want. Belonging is not a special need. It's a universal need. And when we do each of these things well and learn how to do that for young people with disabilities, we've also discovered something about how to do this well for everyone, for anyone. And we do all of these things in response to God's incredible generosity to us because we belong to God. We love because we've been loved. We befriend because we've been befriended. We care for others because we've been cared for. We accept because we've been accepted. We invite because we've been invited and on and on and on. So what does this all mean for each of you? It's a question that only you all can answer. Uh, I had three minutes to talk with two people, so I, I don't know where you all are, but I would encourage you to reflect uh, on each of these 10 dimensions of belonging within your own spheres of influence. Think about the church you're part of, the youth ministry that you lead, and just ask yourself, what are we doing really well in this area right now that we want to keep doing and celebrate and not let go of? But are there things that we can think of that we need to start doing better or more of? We're already doing them in some way, but we really want to amplify them or improve them. Or maybe there's things that we should do entirely differently in light of really being a community for everyone. And what might be a next step as we move towards this vision of belonging uh, as we move forward in this area? Uh, we're going to move, I think, into a moment of Q&A or reactions and reflections in just a minute. 
and uh, if there's time i'll close with a two and a half minute video or three minute video but i'm just going to leave this up on the screen for just a moment uh, to point you back to that kind of reflection as you think about where you are and what kind of change that you want to spur as you move forward so i'll stop there jill and thank you all very much for being part of this conversation well thank you dr carter this is incredibly rich and you've given us a lot of fodder for thought here um we are transitioning into a time of q a so if anyone has a question feel free to put it in the chat I see one that I think you can answer pretty quickly, Eric. Uh, Josh is asking, is this material being expanded into book form? So I'll let you take that for a, a starter yeah. question. I, I think that's um, something that I keep aspiring to get out in a different way um, so that it's a bit more accessible than having to sit on a webinar or anything like that. But I will say at the present, we have a number of resources that you can uh, that are abbreviated versions of this that are written short articles that are very practice focused. And I'll make sure that those come along with the handouts uh, that we could put some links into that. So there's already things that are freely available to access right now. And I do think, you know, I'd, I'd be eager to write something a little bit more expanded, uh, particularly with a youth ministry focus. And you know, my own focus is broader on the whole lifespan, but I think there's some particularities I've tried to call out that would be really important for this context. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, just a quick shout out, there's some wonderful conversation going on in the chat about um, the intersectionality of the, the pieces you're describing with other sectors of ministry, specifically to LGBTQ plus kids, um, addressing issues of uh, anti-racism with youth. These are things that YMI has done as well, and we are so glad to be able to continue to perpetuate. Um, so thank you to those who are raising the, the intersectional pieces here. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Carter. So let's say I'm someone who works with youth and I'm on board with this idea of establishing a sense of deeper belonging uh, for young people with disabilities, really living out the welcome that my church is espousing. But it's a new endeavor for my church to actually figure out how to even start this. Where would someone begin? Yeah, I think... Um... I think there's a number of different ways to do that. You might find that uh, in some churches that we've worked with, they've used this framework to kind of gather people throughout their church. Uh, they've not often focused on youth specifically, but gathering a cross section of church members, of parents, of individuals with disabilities, of, of ministry leaders, of seniors and uh, parents of young kids to reflect together on those four questions that I shared. As we think about our own community right now, what are we doing well? And, and you might be surprised of, of, of the kind of perspectives that people bring about where we're shining in these areas of being welcoming and accepting and others. But then when you get to that next question, which is really what, what do we need to start doing differently in some way, by having people who see your church and its ministry from multiple vantage points, including and especially people with disabilities, you'll heart start to hear some perspectives that might have been overlooked of sort of lenses on your community that you never have thought about. We often encourage, if you're going to do that kind of convening, to invite some people from the local community who are really have uh, professional connections to disability or are disability advocates and advocacy groups and organizations to help you also think about things that maybe never would have crossed your mind uh, in that sense. So I think there's something about bringing people together to share about their experiences and starting with who's already in our midst that we can begin to make sure we're doing this well for before we start reaching out in the broader community when we haven't yet really figured out what our starting point is. And, you know, disability is such a heterogeneous group. It's so widely varied in people's experiences that you really have to talk to people who are already there about what they would need to be part of everything that happens before you're sort of trying to apply generic answers to that question. I'm going to put up on the screen. I'm not going to read it all. I'll just let it linger for a minute, if that's okay, uh, Jill, which is a, a set of recommendations that come from people with disabilities about how a church should begin this process. And we've just turned them into verbs of asking people with this, of advocating people with disabilities, speaking up about the needs, of reflecting as a whole congregation, of asking the perspectives of people with disabilities, of finding out what other churches are doing or what experts might suggest, of building capacity among your leaders to, to welcome well, uh, of 
thinking about your posture, about are we a place that's flexible, that will do things differently if it brings other young people in, and then being proactive in terms of acting on those sorts of things. And of course, bathing all of that with prayer as well. So I'll, I'll let that sit up a minute. Um, and this is something we do have written up if you're wanting to use this as a guide for your own congregation. Yeah, let's leave this up. This looks fantastic. Thank you for this. Um, and I'll, I'll name, you know, this is a, some folks on this chat on this group, in this group know this, but um, this is a personal conversation for me. I'm a parent of a child with autism who certainly would fit in some of those categories you mentioned before and um, have been the, the recipient of well-intended overtures of thinking what would be helpful um, without asking what would be helpful. So I really appreciated your um, discussion of centering it around the guest and it's yeah. the it's the guest who should be the, the person driving what happens as opposed to the host. Um, that was very, very insightful, thank you. Um, so I have a question about, uh, I was curious to hear your comments on barriers. <coughs> What are the impediments that you've seen uh, that um, impediments to churches expressing a welcome to those with disabilities and then living that out? What have you seen churches really struggle with in this yeah. area? Well, you know, it used to be the question was why? Like, why should we do this? It was trying to get churches to understand that the clarity of this call, uh, that, uh, that there can be no asterisks when it comes to disability. That's changed dramatically over, uh, I'd say, beginning about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where now more churches are saying, how? Like, we understand this is important and matters, but we don't know how to do it. And the fears that come up from that, well, we are worried about doing it wrong. We don't want to mess it up. We don't want to actually offend in that action. But also, there, so there's this sense of, of uh, kind of just a vulnerability that that is required to step in and be willing to reflect on your practices and change things. Now, that changing things is another barrier. There are ways we've always done things. There's things that become rooted in congregations that it gets very difficult to say, what would it, you know, for people to step into, are we willing to try things different? Uh, to explore some new ways of gathering or worshiping or praying that might again widen that welcome. So there's, you know, there's a resistance to any kind of change sometimes there as well. And the thing is, you know, um, is that when we do this well, it's going to introduce us into space that is not always, you know, uh, it's not the perfectly controlled environment that some churches work so hard to, to gain. There may be noises, there may be movements, there may be other things that, uh, that evoke this uncomfortability among members that you have to talk through. So I think there's an attitudinal component. I think there's an awareness component. Uh, in some some older churches, it's a it's a physical space component. It's an architectural component, but I think for the most part, it is just not on people's radars. I think it's simply uh, an inadvertent response. Although I can name many many overt responses that reflect barriers, but I think it's you know we ought to do that. But we have so many other pressing needs. There's so many other groups we're not reaching. Why would this be important? And that's where we remind churches, you are already doing disability ministry. There are already people in your midst who are present. You may not know about it. You may not be aware of it. And so the question is, how do we do that well and faithfully uh, as well? So thanks, Jill. Yeah, that's really salient. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Sarah in the chat who uh, references, who's asking for your thoughts around whether these same strategies and mindsets apply to people of all ages. And you mentioned, and I know your background is really um, for the whole life cycle. So wondering specifically about young children, because young children and inclusivity and um, that radical sense of welcome matters and feeds into youth experiences yeah. as well. So can you speak to any of that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's an interesting question of who this does and doesn't apply to. I think I should have said something earlier that these 10 dimensions of belonging are certainly not the only things that would could, people would name when it comes to belonging. We heard dozens and dozens of others as we saw in the chat. So at one level, I just want to emphasize this is not a recipe for it. Um, we often hear things like to be heard, which many of you have shared, to be noticed, uh, to um, uh, uh, 
anyway, I, I have, the others will come to my mind. So at one level, it's not simply that. Uh, it's does the concept of belonging apply to everyone? Yes. Are certain elements of this more or less employment for different people in different contexts uh, and in different ages? Probably so. But we, uh, this model came out of all of our work around uh, uh, individuals across the whole age span. So we do work around inclusion of kids with disabilities, youth, adults, and the whole spectrum. So I think it has relevance, but how you enact it and respond to each of those prompts to reflect is going to look different for younger kids. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we uh, so what I try to do here, if this is helpful, is to connect this specifically to youth but it began with a broader vision of what does this look like for anyone impacted by disability? And I love the issues around intersectionality. It really is a prompt around, how do you think about this for everyone? And in fact, if I don't go on too long, is this has been an entry point to conversations for many churches that were reluctant to conversations about the inclusion of kids with disabilities. It's interesting that in this day and age, inclusion is still hotly debated. Well, maybe we should have a separate class or a program or a separate sensory room or whatever it might be. People debate that very quickly. Nobody debates belonging. Nobody <laughs> debates belonging. And we're not saying, how do we think about this just for people with disabilities? How do we think about this for any member of our community, any segment or demographic or whatever it might be? And so it's a unifying conversation where you could talk about a lot of these other groups that were mentioned in the chat together with a common language that will resonate with everyone. Yeah, that's really helpful reframing. Um, and it, it dovetails into a, a question that Maggie had too. Um, you know, we talk about different age groups, but developmentally, that, that might be a false setup, right? Because so many folks with developmental disabilities do not, um, have behaviors that are in keeping with just their their age of years on this planet, right? So, um, you know, wonderings about how to include people who are adults in terms of birthdays, but who um, have behaviors that are more in keeping with children and how to make those things connect up under a spirit of belonging. Yeah, well, there are many adults who don't also um behave according with their age that are, are not labeled in that way. So I think we want to remember that as well. You know, I, I do remember a, a pastor wondering why a man with Down syndrome was in the sanctuary when he was preaching, because certainly he couldn't understand the sermon. And uh, so why was he in there? And uh, you can imagine where this conversation went. He's making a little bit of noise. Uh, ironically, always at the right time of what the preacher was saying, whereas no one else was. <laughs> and, but I, you know, I just posed the question, you know, we just posed the question back. It sounds to you, me like you expect everyone in the congregation to be able to understand everything that you're sharing as part of your sermon. So maybe we should uh, ha have a test after the next uh, worship service. And anyone who can't pass the test on your sermon shouldn't be allowed to come back. Right. Of course, now the answer was no, 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 no. That's not exactly what I mean. My, my point being in that is there's often behaviors or absence of ways we participate that we assume have to become the normal or otherwise someone can't participate. It also means we have to think we do have to think about how we respond to behaviors, not developmentally, but what do we do whenever there is noise and how do we think about them for families who have kids? So I love the churches that have big signs in sections of their church that say this is a no shush zone. And that was intended for some young uh, adults with autism who might make a bit noise, but guess who it was also filled with? Parents of kids who were also didn't wanna be turned around and looked at. So my point in all, all this is, I think that's there's not an answer to that in the global. I think there's a posture of, let's find out what's at the root of those, what the goals for this person is, and figure out how we can figure out how to support them in whatever greatest ways they wanna be part of, one person at a time. And for some, there'll be times when it's not the right place to be part of the youth group for everything in the same way it is for everyone else. And other times we'll say, maybe we need to change how we gather as a youth group so this person can come in. So I just wanna emphasize there's a dance to this. We're so quick to say, this is how we gather. This person doesn't fit. 
let's find another place or create another space. And what it should be is how can we create a space or move towards a space where there's a broader range of kids who can fit. And when that's still impossible, then let's think about, you know, that one person at a time on um, what our response might be. So. Yep, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, folks, there were a number of questions in the chat that we did not get to, and I have others as well, but I have the unique privilege of being able to interview Dr. Carter in a couple of weeks separately. I have all your questions and I will get to them. So if we didn't get to them today, you will see an answer to them shortly. Um, but this concludes our time. And uh, Dr. Carter, again, just deep gratitude from YMI for your presence and for your scholarship and for your ministry to us and to the greater community. Thank you so much. Folks, thank you so much for coming. We look forward to seeing you again at our next session. But thank you and blessings on your day.